Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Kylie Walker. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and it's my absolutely uh, absolute privilege to welcome you here from around the world today to join us for this uh, webinar to launch our excellent new report towards a waste-free future. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are meeting you. I'm joining you from Ngunnawal and the Gambri country here in Canberra, but we are joining you from country all around Australia um, and acknowledge the deep knowledge and technology that's uh, embedded forever in traditional custodianship of country. Thanks for joining us. We have got people from 18 countries around the world and I'm delighted that we're joined here by uh, representatives of the Australian Research Council, uh, which uh, has supported, generously supported this project um, from industry and from uh, the research sector, including many of the people who generously gave their time and advice to make this report a reality. And um, we're also joined by sister academies from around the world and uh, by representatives of local, state and federal government from across Australia. So thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. This is a major and very timely report, I think, by the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, otherwise known as ATSI, on the technology readiness of Australia's waste and resource recovery sector. Towards a waste-free future presents an exciting vision of what Australia has already achieved in developing waste and resource recovery technology and what we could achieve in the next 10 years with the right policy and economic settings. It's also an excellent summary of the inspiring technology that already exists to bring to fruition a waste-free future. And uh, there are some amazing examples throughout the report. So I do commend it to you and I hope that you have the opportunity to read it if you haven't already done so. So who are we? The Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering brings together Australia's foremost leaders in applied science, technology and engineering. And we provide impartial, practical and evidence-based advice on achieving sustainable solutions and advancing prosperity. We're committed to helping Australia meet the complex challenges that are occurring more and more rapidly uh, as the world continues to change and also to help Australia seize the opportunities presented by our skilled workforce and our ample natural resources. This launch today is the culmination of many, many months of hard work by ATSI's fellows, our stakeholders and collaborators, and of course our staff here on the project team. And um, I thank those of you who've collaborated and contributed to, uh, who, who's, who are joining us today. On behalf of ATSI, I wanna thank absolutely everyone who's been involved and congratulations on this report. It's part of a three year research project that explores Australia's future as supported by technology. And as I mentioned, it's funded by the Australian Research Council. And thank you very much to the ARC for this generous support. During the course of this project, we've worked with experts and innovators and industry leaders to look at how different sectors of Australia's economy are preparing to take advantage of new and emerging technologies. And we're developing a roadmap of what Australia needs in order to fully integrate new technologies and maintain our currency and maximise our economic advantage on a global stage. We're also highlighting research priorities in each sector to guide decisions and to ensure that investment in workforce capability is focused towards Australian industry competitiveness. So as the focus for the project, ATSI's deliberately chosen three sectors that are right for technological disruption. Our first report was on the transport sector. Our second was on the health sector, and uh, that was published in a very timely fashion just as the pandemic started to strike around the world. Um, and of course, there's this report is our final of the three on the waste and resource recovery sector. And early next year, we'll be synthesising all three of these reports and providing a roadmap for ensuring uh, Australia's technological capacity and, uh, and uh, to put us at the forefront of, uh, of a technological economy globally. We're also going to be publishing the methodology that we used in creating these reports. And for those friends who join us from around the world, that's going to be available uh, free for people to use and for other academies around the world to use to create like projects in your own countries. So, how can technology transform Australia's attitudes towards waste? Well, this report points to how we can stop seeing rubbish as an accident or an inevitable end point and start seeing it as a fundamental design flaw that we can solve through technological transformation. Australia creates around 67 million tonnes of waste every year and the National Waste Policy Action Plan has a target of an 80% average recovery rate by 2030. But we know that recycling alone won't achieve this target. Instead, we need to start avoiding waste in the first place, right from the design phase and all the way through the life of a product. 
we need to use products for as long as possible and we need to build systems and sectors based on thoughtfully reusing materials once products reach the end of their first life. Moving to a more circular economy has enormous benefits, not just for the environment, of course it does have benefits for the environment, but also the economy and for job creation. Even just a 5% increase in material efficiency in Australia could, pre could produce a $24 billion increase in the economy. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to ATSI fellows, Philip Butler and Dr. Susan Pond, who are the co-chairs of our expert working group. And we're joined by a few other experts here today as well. They're going to present a summary of the report's key findings and recommendations. But first, we, I'm delighted to hand over to the Minister of the Environment, Susan Lay, MP, who's recorded a message of congratulations for the, for the report. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to launch towards a waste-free future. Since the Prime Minister first announced the waste export ban in August last year, the government has been focused on putting the framework and the investment in place to transform the waste and recycling industry. The Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill will pass the Senate this year, creating a world first, a nation taking responsibility for its own waste onshore rather than exporting. We've named recycling as one of our six national manufacturing priorities as we emerge from COVID. This will be supported through the Recycling Modernisation Fund and the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund. We view waste as not just an environmental problem to solve, it's an economic opportunity to create. And that's why ATSE's work is so important. I'm pleased that the Australian Research Council's Linkage Learned Academics Special Projects Funding Scheme has supported this important investigation of the technological innovations that will revolutionise how we develop, manufacture and manage products. I would like to particularly reference the work on harnessing the power of data and analytics that will transform the Waste and Recycling Centre. A particular interest of my colleague, the Assistant Minister for Waste, Reduction and Environmental Management, Trevor Evans. As announced in last month's budget, the government will deliver a significant investment in a digital platform to increase public access to data and monitor our progress against the seven ambitious waste targets and 80 actions under the National Waste Action Plan. Once again, congratulations on delivering this important piece of work. Thank you, Minister Lee, and thank you very much for your support uh, for the work that's been done and um, the support you've signalled for the work that is to come as a result of this report. We look forward to working with the government towards a bright future for waste and resource recovery. Uh, I'll hand over to, um, to Philip Butler and Dr Susan Pond to present the key findings and the recommendations of the report. Philip is the founder and the chair of Texter Technologies, an innovative manufacturing company that with Phil's leadership has leveraged research collaboration and automation to transform into a healthcare and hygiene leader exporting across the globe. Susan is an Australian scientist and technologist active in business and academia, and she's recognised for her contributions to medicine, biotechnology, renewable energy and sustainability. Susan's also the chair of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network and is a member of the Order of Australia. Together, Phil and Susan have led an expert working group of ATSI fellows and invited experts to guide the project team. Following their presentation, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions of the expert working group. So please use the Q&A function and feel welcome to start typing these questions anytime. We'll be monitoring that chat box and the Q&A and we're absolutely keen to hear what you think about the report, the future of technology in the waste and resource recovery sector. Um, but in the meantime, over to you, Phil and Susan. Um, thank you, Kylie. <clears throat> and on behalf of Susan, I'd like to thank the export working group We've had a lot of fun. We've learned a lot of things together. I'd like to thank the steering committee for their guidance. I'd like to thank the whole ATSI team for their support. And um, in particular, I'd like to thank, I'd single out to thank uh, Alex Siebel, who's uh, driven this project from beginning to end. So ATSI sees huge potential for technology to positively disrupt the waste and resource recovery sector in Australia and support our transition towards a circular economy. Kylie's already mentioned that the 67 million tonnes of waste generated each year, that's 2.7 tonnes per person. And we need to reduce our consumption of finite natural, natural resources by deliberately designing products, systems and infrastructure 
make better use of these materials and by reusing and recycling. Now, I'm a manufacturer by profession and the quote and the concept that really changed how I think about all of this uh, came from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the UK and it said, waste and pollution are not accidents, but the consequences of decisions made at the design stage where 80% of environmental impacts are determined. By changing our mindset to view waste as a design flaw and harnessing new materials and technologies, we can ensure that waste and pollution are not created in the first place. We need to get over this obsession with lower prices and understand that we do pay a price for those cheap goods eventually, both financially and in terms of the environment. Now, ATSI acknowledges that technology isn't the only pathway to a circular economy, but it's essential to the support and guide and will guide the necessary systemic change. Technology will help us design products that are more durable, reusable, repairable, and able to be remanufactured and disassembled once they reach the end of their first life. Advances in technology will mean that we can identify, track, sort, and process materials more efficiently and technology will underpin the entire circular economy system, creating feedback loops and generating data to support policy and investment decisions. So to the report, to begin with, ATSI identified three key challenges for the sector in the immediate future. The transition to viewing waste as a valuable resource, our domestic capacity to process that waste and emerging waste streams. And we, when we look out to 10 years time, we see waste streams becoming income streams. So a different way of viewing the, the, the issue. Australia ready to transition to a circular economy and reduced environmental impacts from waste. Now, how will we achieve these outcomes? ATSI identified three technology supported solution areas, which are the role of design, role of design keeps coming up, improved product stewardship, and advanced resource recovery and manufacture. In Etsy's, Etsy's vision for Australia's future, these solutions, which can be brought to life by our recommendations, will transform the waste and resource recovery sector. It will be an enabler for advanced manufacturing, a key part of our supply chains, and a center for innovation and job creation. To ex explain how we get there, I'd like to introduce Susan Pond, who will go into more detail about Etsy's findings. Thank you, Phil. Very, very good uh, summary of the year report. It's been a pleasure working with you and the committee. To achieve the vision that Phil's just laid out, a number of things need to happen, of course. As Phil has said, technology is not the sole pathway to a circular economy, but it is essential to support and guide the necessary systemic change. Australia will need to develop, adapt, or adopt new and existing technologies across a number of sectors, particularly in manufacturing. Consumers will need to be more alert to the consequences and power of their choices and use that market power to demand quality, accountability, and sustainable business practices from manufacturers and retailers. So just how ready is Australia to move to a circular economy? ATSI has, through its extensive research and consultations with over 100 stakeholders, analysed the technology-supported solution areas that Phil listed against five readiness parameters, which are shown in this slide. These are infrastructure readiness, skills availability, social readiness, economic feasibility, and policy and regulatory readiness. And to Kylie's point about this being the third report in a series, this has been the framework for all three of the reports. The first on transport, the second on health, and this, the third one on waste resource recovery. The next slide uh, summarizes ATSI's findings on uh, which are related to, to our technology readiness assessment for the waste recovery sector. Each parameter is rated on a scale 
from not ready, which would be an empty circle, to ready, which be, would be a completely filled circle. As you see, we don't have any completely filled circles. And it's clear economic feasibility and policy and regulatory readiness are at least prepared to enable the uptake and deployment of new technologies in this sector. Infrastructure, both physical and digital, also needs work. But of course, these can be interdependent, and Axi points out in the report in particular that gains in infrastructure are dependent on investment, which of course depends on economic feasibility and policy settings. Atsi also found that to create a thriving low waste economy, Australia needs a national framework that includes long-term policy certainty, incentive-based policies, and consistency across jurisdictions and portfolios. Australian state and territory governments must work together to lead this paradigm shift towards waste avoidance using targeted government investment and regulatory reform. Sensors and big data analytics must be employed to inform decision making. And finally, a systems approach to increasing the productivity of resources and increasing their recoveries required across the entire life cycle of all products. The high scores in the circles in skills availability and social readiness suggest that if right economic and policy frameworks are in place, the potential for innovation-driven growth in Australia's waste and resource recovery sector is huge and immediate. This innovation will create new industries and jobs while also benefiting the environment. Based on the findings in the report, ASI has made four key recommendations to address the low technology readiness levels in economic feasibility, policy and regulatory readiness, and infrastructure readiness. These are presented in detail in the report, but the headline recommendations are shown in this slide. They are a paradigm shift to design for waste avoidance, a systems approach to increase resource productivity and recovery, big data and analytics to inform decision making by policy makers, businesses and consumers, and targeted government investment and regulatory reform and policy certainty. These four key recommendations and the detailed guidance supporting them that is provided in the full report highlight focused, immediate, agenda-setting actions for government, industry, and the research sector to create a thriving circular economy in Australia. They support and accelerate work towards the ambitious targets for waste avoidance, resource recovery, and recycling that are in Australia's National Waste Policy Action Plan. They provide a guide for industry to shift towards, them, towards more sustainable business practices. Readers of the report will find plenty of inspiration in the form of case studies that, are already, that already exist and are, are reported in some detail in the, in the document. Last but not least, the four recommendations provide priorities for research that will create cutting edge technologies right here in Australia to support our shift towards a waste-free future. Phil, um, back to you. Thank you, Susan, and also I thoroughly enjoyed working with you on this project. Look, um, I commend the report to you as it's worth a read, um, but be warned, uh, it indicates that change is coming, and as always, there are threats and opportunities. Personally, reading through the report many times over, there are so many interesting facts and examples, as Susan has indicated. And if the recommendations are followed, the government's targets for waste reduction are eminently achievable. The COVID response has demonstrated that society can adapt and change rapidly if the right direction is clearly articulated. And better design can eliminate or minimise waste and efficient use, reuse and repair must be encouraged. Now, can I just give you one tiny example that's detailed in the report? 
uh, and this ex uh, explains what these words mean to us. Design has traditionally focused on variables such as cost and performance as opposed to sustainable circular economy principles. The mass-produced PET bottle generally uses a coloured high-density polyethylene cap and a paper label. When a bottle is chipped to be recycled, the cap and the label contaminate the material stream and lower the value to the processor. Now, of course, you can use sensors, etc., to separate the contaminants, but there's always a risk that a small amount will get through the system and lower the value of the material stream. So why does a PET bottle need a high-density PET, high-density polyethylene cap and a paper label? What if the bottle had a clear PET cap and a PET label or no label at all? Then the recycling process could produce a clean material stream with certainty that can be used confidently in high quality products. Or perhaps that bottle could use a digital watermark, which could also allow it to be traced through the system, providing guidance to consumers about its disposal and leave no trace. Now, what's interesting, this report goes one step further and asks, why do we need a disposal bottle at all? An example uh, as a different business model is like the popular soda stream for carbonated water, which allows you to fill a reusable bottle from the tap at home and a refillable gassing system to produce a finished product in your own home. And this totally eliminates the waste stream. It's one tiny example. It doesn't solve the whole problem, but it's a, an example of where things can go. And the report is full of these examples. Innovative business models, such as product as a service, must be encouraged and fostered. We need to design products so that they are made to last and we can more easily recover components and materials. We need to increase the use of recovered and recycled material and build demand markets for recycled products. We need targeted government investment and regulatory reform as well as policy certainty. And we need to change design thinking and these changes will disrupt some industries as competitive business adapt more quickly to the circular economy. But once the direction is set, and I think this is a very important point, we have the technological skills to move Australia forward very quickly. Underpinning this, of course, we need information to support innovation, guide investment, and enable consumer decisions. Technology will support the waste and resource recovery sector to thrive during this shift towards a circular economy. And with the right framework, the technology highlighted in this ATSI report can create new industry and employment and create positive social, economic, environmental outcomes, shifting the paradigm towards a waste-free future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil and Susan. Um, the, this, I think it's a fascinating topic and it's an excellent report. We've had a couple of questions in the chat already about where to find it. It is available on our website, www.atse.org.au. And you can find also the, uh, the previous reports that we've mentioned today on transport and the health sector as well on, on the website. And I do encourage you to, to read through the report um, because it includes many examples of the technology that's available and in use right now that can be deployed uh, to support a circular economy. But now it's over to you. So this is your opportunity now to ask the expert working group about the report's findings and the recommendations, and uh, I guess also their predictions and their hopes for the future of waste and resource recovery in Australia. We're very lucky to be joined today to, uh, by a panel that represents a breadth of experience uh, in this area, as well as Philip and Susan on the panel today. We have Professor Vina Sarjwala. She's an ATSI fellow, and she's the founding director of the Centre of Sustainable Materials Research and Technology at UNSW. We also have Professor Murray Scott, also an ATSI Fellow and a world leading innovator and researcher in advanced composite materials. We're joined by Damien Gyoko, who's an invited expert and Deputy Director of the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS 
and Gail Sloan, who's an invited expert and CEO of WAMA, the Waste Management and Resource Recovery Association of Australia. So thank you very much to our expert panellists. Uh, all of them were involved in uh, contributing to this report and your questions are very, very welcome. But I guess I might kick it off um, for Susan and Philip as co-chairs of the expert working group. Can I just ask you firstly, if these recommendations are followed, what does Australia look like in 2030? Can I chip in there, um, Susan? Um, I've mentioned that before in the talk I just gave that the most important thing is to change society's uh, viewing of waste streams and to see them as valuable resources and uh, as income streams. Um, for Australia to recognise the benefits of a circular economy, um, the importance, it's an ethical and social uh, issue. and. Uh, dramatically reduced environmental impacts because of the elimination of waste generally. Thanks, Phil. I don't have much to add to that. I think 2030 is only 10 years off, but it will be a decade of great productivity in this sector, particularly given the converging work of ATSI and the Australian government and the state governments. So uh, we, we will in 10 years, in my view, be in a position where we're much smarter doing uh, with what we're doing in man manufacturing and uh, reusing waste. And also, and more particularly, and I'm sure there'll be questions on this, much smarter in avoiding waste by designing it out. Thanks very much. We have a question from the audience and I'm going to throw this one to Gail. What would it take to achieve the paradigm shift in design for waste avoidance? Well, given that I'm probably the most mandatory type person out there, I guess I'd be looking to government policy. And the reason I'd be saying that is because um, leaving it to the market has not worked. Um, and I think we need some market signals that are going to help with that. So having a, a price signal is going to be key to actually getting that and putting obligation on the generators to look at how they manage that waste and how they take responsibility. Because I think that we've seen in the absence of a, of a market signal, a cost signal, it's been very difficult for generators to take their own on board. Um, we have to as a community and as a nation start thinking about the fact that we're dealing with natural materials that are resources that should be able to be used over and over again. Um, and we need to have some incentives to shift that obligation and that paradigm along, I think. Thank you, Gail. I think the next question is for Damien, and that is the design issue is fundamental, but the report seems to focus on the waste and resource recovery sector. That's true. That is the sector we focused on. But obviously, that's not where those design decisions are made. So how can the feedback loops be put in place so that the implications of design are felt by those who have the power to make the decisions? I think it's important to to extend it, producer responsibility and 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 think in a in a system. We're seeing the really the underpinning structures of Australia's economy changing, whether it's from more investment in renewables, digital technology, even you know, working from home, and and we need to adapt and and bring this system's uh, view to bear. And I think designing for and delivering a circular economy is really a key pillar of uh, of enabling that prosperity and jobs. And two. Uh, points I would would emphasize in this space are that firstly by having these feedbacks it means we can generate more value from our resources so the report recommends a target of doubling resource productivity by 2030 Australia is currently lucky to generate 90 cents from every kilogram of material we use in the economy whereas in Japan it's towards four dollars so we can improve resource productivity and circularity by as we've heard, designing out waste, making reuse and repair easy, developing markets to enable reutilization and an extended producer responsibility. And the second point is that we need those enabling policies like the Australian government's focus on product stewardship. And with recent announcements, uh, announcements about establishing a product stewardship center of excellence and investment fund grants, I think there's a real opportunity to work together, industry, research, government, civil society to, to mainstream excellence and, 10 years time, we can we look back and be uh, proud of the work we've done here in Australia. 
Thank you very much, Damien. I, I guess R&D has a big part to play uh, in making this more cost effective. And I think the next questions, and I'm going to wrap two questions together uh, from Wei Zhang, and I'm going to direct these to Veena. So firstly, who are the key players in the R&D space um, in Australia? And secondly, what recommendations would you make for government investment in R&D? I think the fact that we have to look at this as a collaborative effort is really important. I mean, you know, having government, industry and communities looking at their part in the overall circular economy coming to life means that, you know, this collaborative effort that allows government investment to encourage more and more of this collaborative, uh, you know, whether it's about the R&D, whether it's about developing new technologies, piloting, trialing and testing new technologies, um, allows, of course, everyone to benefit from that so if you are someone who is in the waste management business but you can see a way in which your material can be value added that value creation piece may not necessarily be something that you can do yourself but you can indeed collaborate with other businesses who are manufacturers who may be excited about the fact that your resources can be put into the supply chain and, and part of the work that we're doing as part of um, New South Wales Circular, as an example, um, you know, funded by the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, is to be able to bring together uh, that collaboration between various stakeholders. So having supply chains that actually show that there are many different pathways um, is going to be important for everyone to find various solutions that work in their particular region. So I think more and more of collaborative R&D projects um, which I think I believe the Recycling Modernization Fund is a good example of bringing together industry and government um, to work together to, to deliver on solutions is going to be an important, um, important thing. Thank you, Veena. Gail, Stacey asks what the barriers are to establishing a remanufacturing industry. And Stacey says, my understanding is that under current regulations, e-waste in Victoria, for example, has to be recycled and can't be reused. Um, would you be able to comment on any efforts to introduce the right to repair type of legislation? Um, there are real challenges, I guess, in the short term around recycling in the sense of the regulatory regime that enables a product to go from being a waste, something that's discarded, into uh, a product that can go back out to market, particularly in each jurisdiction. One of the, the ongoing challenges and frustration for our sector is every state has a different approach to how we manage that material as it goes through the supply chain. So moving towards um, a national approach in relation to um, how we take what is essentially material, and because I hate the word waste, I would love to have that reduced, for, eliminated from the lexicon and actually recognise that we're dealing with material that's going through, I guess, different life cycles is got to be Nirvana and having a regime in Australia that supports that through recognising that it is a natural common market. We need a common approach to do this because particularly when you think so many companies work across state borders. So that regulatory regime is challenging and is one of the things that I, I know very much is on um, the, the national agenda, how we achieve that. Right to repair is, I guess, an interesting one. I know Productivity Commission is looking at some of these issues right now. Um, you know, this where we've got this paradigm that um, enables people to take, or companies, manufacturers, generators take responsibility. Uh, if we look at what's happening in Europe with intention, with increasing move to a service-based model where people take responsibility for the product they put on market, um, you know, having legislation that arguably aligns warranty periods, the availability of spare parts, again, that, that moves a shift in valuing the materials that what we put onto market and having that policy support is so key to ensure that there's real clarity as to the fat parts are available, how long a product should be in operation and what the obligation is to maintain and manufacture. So, you know, that regulatory suite in Australia is um, a long way behind, unfortunately, what we see in European Union and others who've already made that shift to, to managing material and also managing emissions and carbon. So, you know, it is a great opportunity for us from an environmental and economic point of view. However, it really does, in my view, need accelerating. Thanks, Carly. Thank you, Gail. Um, I, the next question comes from Paul Wood, and uh, thanks for joining us, Paul, one of our new board members here at, at the Academy of Technology and Engineering. Um, and Paul is uh, asking about how we uh, examined food waste as a waste stream and the options to manage that. Uh, does anybody want to jump in on that from the panel? I know we looked at organics. Gail, you're, you're 
yeah, so so Kylie, the importance of managing food waste, do you say? Um, yeah, like food waste is, you know, food waste for me, the big the big opportunity in food waste is avoidance. And that is really a great piece of work that um, has been done by many jurisdictions. And I'm really excited that we're actually moving towards a national food waste or food governance body coming online soon. I'm not sure if it's been announced exactly who's doing that, but looking at what we've seen overseas with things like Love Food, Hate Waste and Rap UK and their approach to putting money back in people's pockets around the fact that, you know, we do lose between 30 to $60 a week um, at households by food waste. So, you know, there's food for me is the great opportunity around avoidance and, and helping people to do better with that. Ellen McCarthy Foundation has done a phenomenal piece of work around going circular with food. If people haven't read that, that's one of those documents that is a bit of a seminal piece, I think. Um, and it's got lots of good resonance for Australia in my mind around how we manage food, how, how we work with the integration of things like packaging. We do tend to focus on plastic packaging. We assume that all plastic is bad. That is not the case. It plays a really important role when it comes to food and length of life and you know avoiding food waste and also carbon. So there's really important roles there, but also how we go local. We do deal with things like transport miles, how we manage water, how we manage all the um, attributes of that that um, life cycle with food. So food is a really important one. And, you know, the government has done a really good job um, in Australia of actually recognising that with its um, national food waste strategy, the commitment of the reduction, I think, of 40% of um, organics to um, landfill by 2030, and now with the resourcing of the new food body. So, so that is a big topic in Australia, and it's one that's got great resonance with the community that we can do really, really well on, I think. Hope that Thanks. was right. Thank you, Gail. Um, the next question is something that I'm really fascinated by, and I, I think there's enormous potential for big data to play a part in supporting a circular economy. So Charles wants to know, um, and Phil, I, I think I'll be throwing this one to you. No, sorry, Susan. Susan, I'll throw this one to you. Which companies are working well in the big data and analytics space already? In, uh, waste, in the waste recovery sector? I will, I will hand that over to Gail, but before I do, I would say that the big data uh, based on sensors, which are made smart, of course, by big data and analytics are really uh, coming to the fore these days. Sensors are everywhere. The whole physical world is being digitized as we speak, and that will be, uh, more and more the case as uh, new technologies come online like the, uh, the 5G network. So sensors will be everywhere in manufacturing, in the community, uh, they'll, be, uh, they'll be in our garbages, they'll be in our power systems, they'll be in uh, inner and outer space. So in a way it's not uh, which companies are working in the space but I, as I said I will throw to Gail on that, it'll be every company will be working in the space within i think in the next 10 years uh, right across right across uh, the economy but i'll throw to gail for the particular companies that are doing well now in the waste and resource recovery sector oh look i really was I, I will love to give a plug for a few of our um very bright people who are on this call today i can see john gutsakis from equilibrium and joe pickin from blue environment who are actually specialists i would say in this field um you know i think that the thing about our sector is we're no different to any other sector we've got to have a strong evidence-based um, policy development based on data uh, and damien uts your team you know we've got lots of interest from universities uh, the key is one of the challenges we've got at present is the data gathering in our sector. It's not strong. Um, you know, a lot of it is um, challenging in relation to where regs are set up and the ability to, to share data. One of the positives I would say that came out of China's national sword and um, our sector almost coming out of the dark and into the light for as far as public conscience was, it started to really um, make people look closer at the data. For those of us who've been involved for a long time, we know it's there, but you know, we, we don't know very well what happened to the material after it goes in the gate of the first facility. Um, and I know this is about going circular, but actually being able to track material flows is really fundamental to understanding where the interventions are. So it's fantastic that we've seen the federal government as well as most of the states now committing to investment in data and key to that is obviously getting the data at the right point in the supply chain and also linking the supply chain. Australia has not been good at gathering data throughout the supply chain compared with if you look at the work that say RAP UK are doing. So 
great opportunity in this area for data. And I'm sure there's a lot of data nerds watching today who, who really want to get involved with that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you both. Um, I guess as well as data, we've um, identified that there are regulatory uh, barriers and opportunities. And Murray, I want to uh, delve into, into that a little bit with you. So we've found in the report that technology itself isn't actually the core issue in the waste and re resource recovery sector. So the tech already exists, but it's not necessarily being taken up. Um, and that's due to economic factors. So I'm keen to hear from you as part of a successful product stewardship organisation in Paintback. Can you give us a bit of an idea of where the key barriers and opportunities exist for technology in your experience? Okay, thanks Kylie. Um, well, I, I'm glad that I can talk about Paintback briefly because this has been a great um, success story, an example of an industry sector getting together voluntarily uh, to address its product and uh, its full life cycle. So about five years ago, the Australian paint manufacturers uh, got together to establish Paintback. Um, and uh, for the past four years, Paintback's been progressively ramping up and diverting more and more unwanted paint and packaging uh, from landfill to the point now that there's uh, over 8,000 tonnes uh, now not going into landfill because of this voluntary product stewardship scheme. So. Now, it's true to say technologies uh, for addressing these problems exist, but of course we need to note that, you know, that there's always engineering challenges in implementing new materials and processes. And also everything has to be economically feasible. So that's why for sure the um, policy and regulatory framework uh, has to be in place. Um, but then it gets down to actual manufacturers uh, addressing the issues. So. In terms of specifically, you know, barriers and opportunities, well, as part of the, uh, the paint manufacturer's approach, uh, R&D was always to be a key aspect of the work of Paintback. And uh, that's where I came in. So I have the privilege of chairing the R&D committee. Um, and for the past three years, we've been building up a portfolio of um, collaborative R&D activities. And they're the underpinning um, principle, of course, is that, uh, as uh, my colleagues have said, it's not waste, it's a valuable resource to be dealt with properly. And uh, so our R&D projects are all focusing on exactly that. So an example is paint has titan titanium dioxide in it, and that is a valuable resource. But how do you extract that uh, and how do you do it feasibly? So that's... Um, uh, that's the subject of one of our R&D activities. But then um, dealing with contamination of polypropylene containers uh, and getting it into a recycled format, that's, that's one of our current projects as well, which um, all are progressing well. So um, lots of opportunity and, and of course, um, engineering challenges, which will be solved by advanced design and, and manufacturing technologies. Terrific. Thank you very much, Murray. I think it's an excellent scheme and there are lots of really inspiring examples through the report um, of how this is being done really, really well. So I do um, once more encourage you to read the full report if you haven't had the opportunity to do that. Fina, I think that you might be the person to answer Meredith's question. Meredith wants to know what the technological opportunities are for remote communities. So for example, with a population of less than a thousand and people who are cut off from uh, those big urban centres for much of the year. Yeah, thanks, Kylie. And that's a, that's a really important question that in a way affects lots and lots of communities across the world. Um, so if you can imagine that you've got population centers that are really small and, and really the traditional way of thinking about, you know, large scale, large economies of scale kind of technologies are never going to be um, suited uh, for these types of uh, remote communities. So in that regard, you've got to start to think about localization. And when you ask localization, you actually do want to be able to have solutions that are able to, you know, take the materials, um, colleagues have talked about materials as resources, and of course, channeling them into various manufacturing pathways. So we need to be able to think about how indeed, if we were encouraging more and more of, um, small businesses uh, that 
perhaps might be operating in these communities to actually look at ways in which they can diversify their small businesses. So, you know, if you're somebody who's already, uh, let's say, collecting waste um, and you've got lots of waste plastics on hand, there's a lot of, lot of waste electronics, then you can imagine a situation where you might be able to channel that into a small scale manufacturing of, you know, using, for instance, 3D printing. And that's a good way in which you can imagine small businesses in remote communities um, can really diversify. Um, and obviously it requires, you know, uh, upskilling. That's important. You know, if you don't necessarily have those skills, then certainly that's, that's a good way to create more jobs in, in the community. Uh, but ultimately we have to think local in many of these instances. So you, you will never be able to make things economically viable if you're depending on transport of waste over long distances. And if you're going to be spending money on transportation of waste over long distances, you might as well invest that money back into your own community and imagine how you might be able to, in a collaborative way, uh, work with your local council, for instance, um, work with small businesses in your region, to really start to encourage more and more of uh, localized production, whether it is using um, you know, waste plastics as an example of what I gave using 3D printing. So I think to me, example of micro businesses that start to look at where emerging technologies uh, can in fact be deployed in an affordable manner is certainly the way to go um, in, in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Veena. Um, look, we do have time for a handful more questions. So if there, if you can see in the Q&A box that there's a particular question that you would like the panel to address um, as a matter of priority, you can always vote that question up, give it a thumbs up, and the more thumbs up it gets, the higher up the, the list it, it goes. It makes the, the most of the opportunity that I might actually see it. This next question is for Damien, uh, and uh, Quincy wants to know, how do we know that we're getting it right? What, how are we going to know that we've had success um, in achieving the, the aims and objectives that we've laid out in this report? I think for me, uh, it's being able to have this, not so much as an add-on, but that the good solutions are the mainstream, the the classic solutions that, that we uh, look to and that we start to embed uh, these uh, innovations into the fabric of the future of the Australian economy. I think when we get down to specifics, there is there's more important work to do about the, the indicators uh, because look, over the next decade, there are other things that are, that are changing, for example, Yes, we have, as Ben mentioned, you know, which is a, a great underpinning of the, the concept of the micro factories, bring, bring the factory to the community rather than the waste to a centralised facility because of the transport. Now, the carbon footprint of that, of that transport as we move to an electric future that's to be powered by renewables starts to change. So I think it's important that as we uh, embark on this journey towards circular, we think what's working well now and uh, what's still going to uh, work well in the decade ahead. We need to make sure it's safe and circular as we start to uh, send more resources around the loop. We, we want to certainly uh, keep toxics away. Designing out is best, but in the, in the interim, we need to be uh, mindful of those things. We need to be uh, mindful of who wins, who loses, where do the benefits and, uh, and trade-offs sit and, and uh, have a conversation about uh, that it can it can be a, a system that um, uh, is coupled with the right incentives to to make it mainstream. So I think it's actually a really exciting area of work. I know even state uh, jurisdictions are starting <clears throat> here in New South Wales to more pay more attention to how do we uh, think about this uh, the, the settings, for example, in the development of the uh, the next twenty year waste uh, strategy. And I think for me that's a a further reflection of being confident uh, collectively and as a country to look ahead at, at those sort of time horizons and, and make that uh, planning just part of, uh, of how we go about things in Australia. And I think that'll really help us uh, underpin success. Thanks. Thanks very much, Damien. Thank you uh, from the Academy's president, Professor Hugh Bradlow, who joins us online. And he's uh, He's keen to know how um, the right to repair legislation will deal with legitimate safety concerns, for example, with self-driving cars. Gail, I'm going to throw to you for this one. 
How does the right to repair legislation deal with legitimate safety concerns? Well, I think we're talking theory here and it's definitely not my specialty. I, might, I would prefer maybe John or Gitsakas if you could answer or Damien would, but I would think that given the importance that design um, and the legislative approach of sustainable, that they would absolutely cover work health and safety and other issues within that. But um, I can't speak from experience. So I don't know if Damien can help me out here. I think as with self-driving cars, uh on the road per se, it's new. It's something that the legislation will need to uh, work through and not be too far behind uh, the the technology. Uh, so that's, uh, as Gail said, it's on the horizon. So the, the complete answer is not fully there yet. But the, the other point, I think it's helpful to spotlight in relation to right to repair, and we, we see mention of this in the, in the report, is just the incentives you see in some other countries for ex example tax incentives that can uh, encourage a repair so that it's not an uh, you know an expensive endeavor but can be more of a, a routine endeavor but yeah I think as we think in this digital world and uh, uh, it's not only things like self-driving cars we'll, we'll need to make sure that the uh, legislation is aligned with ensuring that the the good societally and the value is uh, appropriately shared and managed. Thank you both. Uh, really heading into a wind up now, but uh, there's a, a question that's obviously been very popular from Polly. Um, so uh, the, the question is the bottle schemes have allowed the general public to focus on returning materials so that they have an incentive to do so. Murray, I might be coming to you on this one, I think. Is there scope to do this for other things as well? Um, and that might avoid some of the issues at the other end with commingled recycling or are there other hurdles? I'd say there's definitely other opportunities. I think that was a fairly, fairly broad uh, question there, but um, uh, obviously, I was talking about paintback earlier, and that, that's an example of, of where uh, it's a model where when the original product is purchased, uh, 15 cents a litre um, is collected by the, um, uh, by the manufacturers and delivered to paintback to enable the product stewardship activity to go on. So that's, um, that's different to returning a deposit back to the consumer. Um, so that I guess there's a range of models which need to be adapted to whatever the specific um, product you're talking about. I think I, I'll probably have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Murray. Murray. Gail, did you have something to add there about the incentives for the public to return materials? Yeah, look, I, I think that um, the, the return and earn or the cash for cans or, or depending on what jurisdiction you're in or South Australia is a great example of polluter pays. Um, uh, policy in Australia. It's probably one of the, the few that's at scale. So, you know, um, what it does is it um, obviously incentivizes um, cleaner streams of, of source spread materials and sets up a uh, system in order for that to occur. And that's, that's always really key that we have definite systems for um, materials to return to in order to be aggregated to make it economically viable. I think what that does done is um, brought to the fore that there is a cost associated with this aggregation and management of material and absolutely someone has to pay for that cost um, be it the council at curbside and the ratepayer or at the generator there is um, it's been terrific in raising the profile around the fact there is a cost of managing this material but there's also a value creation there's jobs created there's infrastructure created so there's a benefit for doing it so absolutely um, more polluter pays policies um, that have that clear cost and that clear benefit would be a great move for Australia with Australian policy. Thanks very much, Gail. Look, we, we're just about out of time. And just to wrap us up on, an, on a high note, a note of optimism, if you like, and I'd like to invite all of the panellists now to share your favourite example of how technology is leading us towards a waste-free economy. We've already heard a few examples, and there are certainly a, a, an extraordinary amount of excellent and inspiring examples peppered through the report. Um, I'm going to look at the pictures that, that and in the order in which you appear on my screen. I'm going to dob you in first, Susan. Okay, so I'm most excited about the bioeconomy, which brings in a number of the questions, particularly around food, but uh, also uh, agriculture and the opportunity to replace the petrochemical industry with uh, 
with a whole lot of renewable products, which can of course be circular, and also have brings in the opportunity to capture the the waste from petrochemicals and convert them using, for example, microorganisms that eat gases and converting them into renewable products. So that's the area that I find uh, the organic, uh, the organic area, the bioeconomy, which is really surging and will go ahead in uh, leaps and bounds in the next 10 years in, in my vision at least. It's very exciting, isn't it, Susan? Murray, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but jump in and give us your favourite example. Ah, well, uh, <laughs> I, um, I wanted to highlight um, the, the, all of the examples that take advantage of advanced design and manufacturing because that's, that's where it has to happen. So um, materials design, um, where you, you're actually uh, not using conventional materials because they can't be properly, um, appropriately um, recycled or, or enable remanufacturing. That's a classic example. And then, of course, just the, the whole advanced engineering side of embedding sensors uh, to be able to track materials and track products, the whole internet of things. That's uh, what I think is most exciting. Perfect, thank you. Gail, uh, what gets you inspired in this space? Oh, too much, I think. I just think there's so much good stuff going on in the space and, and you know, I'm really grateful that ATSI have um, shone the spotlight on our sector. Um, one thing that, you know, and there's lots of great examples from the IKEA bringing back the products and recirculating that material. Um, one that I really, really love, and if people are ever bored, watch uh, YouTube and Davos Circulars. Um, there's a guy I met, came across there, and we brought him out to Australia called Arthur from MiniWiz, who's basically um, has created this um, uh, facility that can take plastic from anywhere in the world and turn it into tiles and build things. So he's the guy who's actually got built Nike um, shop fronts out of waste materials. He's built, uh, done the same for Starbucks. And, and it's just showing from that, um, technology piece he's worked out polymers and what they can be used for and he tells a funny story that he's even built a boat but it actually sunk but he's just it's mind-blowing what they are doing with taking material that's been used once and using technology to trap it and turn it back into other things he's built schools in in the middle of nowhere he's just awesome so he's my favorite little case study and just shows the power of what can be thank you gail uh, in one or two sentences please Vina, what's uh, what's the most exciting for you at the moment I think for me, um, you know, Kylie, to just see the level of passion that you see from small businesses, um, people who've got, you know, really what might be seen as very sort of narrow and specific type of challenge, but yet wanting to be able to pick up on what they can see as, as potentially a huge, huge opportunity. And I think to me, um, these are a, a lot of them high tech manufacturers, but want to take the responsibility for the waste coming out of their business and recognizing that there is enormous value and potential. Uh, so wanting to do more and diversify and bring together recycling and manufacturing. So. Perfect. Damien, um, tell us what's getting you excited at the moment in this space. Well, homegrown favorite for me is re-electrify Melbourne. Uh, Start of looking how do we extend the life of batteries and I just see Australia more broadly has such a huge opportunity in not only responsibly supplying materials into the to this global battery revolution but in, in thinking about how do we design uh, and and offer opportunities to extend the life of uh, these batteries so that would be the homegrown favorite I think internationally uh, the the work of uh, Fairphone for the the mobile telephone that um, uh, is easy to uh, repair and upgrade is always a great one as well. Thank you, Damien. Phil, last but by no means least. Thank you, Kylie. Um, look, uh, there's no silver bullet um, to solve this problem. Uh, the most exciting thing I found from the report was the willingness of society to change. We've shown it with COVID, you know, we can do things differently. It's shocked us all what we could achieve over this period. And I think you'll find that um, society will drive market change. Um, and uh, the goal of uh, the 2030 goals will be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. And thank you, everybody, all of our panellists, and thank you to all of the, uh, the people who've joined us online and, and asked the questions in particular as well. 
um, Phil, Susan, Bina, Murray, Gail and Damien and also of course the ATSI team who've supported this work um, throughout the life of the project and, and for the launch today. Um, I'm really excited about the future. I think there's an extraordinary potential here and I'm, I'm really hopeful that we're able to start to uh, implement the recommendations of, of this report and see some transformation in the next few years. So thank you very much. Please do go and download the full report from the website at atse.org.au forward slash waste tech and get in touch of course if you have any questions or would like to hear more. Thanks everyone for joining us.